Coming up, the latest border wall construction project starts in San Diego with the replacement of 14 miles of fencing. This is the corrugated steel material that will be taken down and replaced. I'm Paul Kerr. I'll take on the special interests. We're both Democrats. And we're both endorsing Sarah Jacobs. Congressional candidates making a final push for votes this weekend, and we're following the campaign money. And for the most part, everybody says, oh, it's kid time, and they take a break. All right, let's get ready to walk, guys. Making the streets safer for kids in one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Francisco. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. It's the latest step in President Trump's mission to increase border security. Workers started another border wall construction project today in San Diego. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero joins us from San Ysidro with more. Jean. These helicopter steel landing mats from the Vietnam War went up in the 90s to stem the flow of illegal immigration through San Diego. They're part of the barriers that the Trump administration just started replacing nearby in Borderfield State Park. The project involves replacing 14 miles of these barriers, starting near the Pacific Ocean and stretching east to Otay Mesa Mountain, where these barriers currently end. The construction company is Texas-based SLSCO, awarded a $147 million contract. U.S. Customs and Border Protection called this a top priority project. Two other border wall construction projects are currently underway, one to replace two miles of fencing in Calexico and another in New Mexico. The Trump administration says these barriers are old and need replacing. Reporting live from the border, Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Thanks, Jean. New numbers show a clear leader in the race for Daryl Issa's congressional seat. The San Diego Union Tribune and 10 News have a new poll out on the race for the 49th. State tax board member Diane Harkey is in the lead with 24 percent of likely voters. Democrats Doug Applegate and Sarah Jacobs are tied for second. As part of California's open primary, the top two candidates will compete in the November election. Now to a follow-up to one of our Show Us Your Mailers fact checks. Earlier this week, we checked out a mailer sent out by congressional candidate Josh Butner, critical of rival Amar Kapanajar. Both Democrats are running in the 50th congressional district. KVBS reporter Jade Hyman has been sorting out the controversy. The mailer cites an article in Breitbart and says Amar Kapanajar pledged to work with Donald Trump. It says he even defended Trump's Muslim ban and called it, quote, sensible. The problem is that the sensible quote does not exist in the Breitbart article referenced in the mailer. KPBS received an emailed response from the Butner campaign to our inquiries about that mailer. The campaign manager provided a link to a February 2017 opinion piece written by Camp Najjar. In it, he wrote, and while I disagree with the first implementation, I cannot categorically object to the current administration's efforts to temporarily restrict travel from what the Obama administration identified as countries of concern. If President Obama's former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, expressed concerns with our vetting process, then it's sensible for President Trump to place temporary restrictions on these countries until his cabinet determines whether better vetting procedures are needed. Campanajar says Butner's mailer mischaracterized his words. Jade Hindman, KPBS News. This primary season, KPBS news partner iNewsSource has been following the campaign money. Not only how much politicians are raising, but where it's coming from. Earlier, I checked with iNewsSource reporter Jill Castellano. Jill, let's jump right in. The 49th Congressional District race has been one of the most competitive in the nation ever since Congressman Darrell Issa decided not to run for a ninth term. Can we talk about the spending in this race and how the candidate spending differs from outside groups? 
Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So this is highly competitive. Democrats are hoping to flip the seat. So we have a lot of outside groups that are fundraising to help the Democratic candidates. The two top fundraisers for their own campaigns are Paul Kerr and Sarah Jacobs, who are two Democrats, and they both have put more than a million dollars toward their own campaign. So they have a lot of personal money that they're using to elevate their profile. Then you have someone like Sarah Jacobs, who is also getting outside help from a group called Women Vote, another $2 million this group has spent to support her campaign. So you're seeing a lot of outside groups get involved. The candidates have raised a total of $11 million. There's another $5.8 million being spent by these other organizations trying to get their favorite candidates elected. And can we turn now to the district attorney's race? The last time you and I spoke, you talk, told me about the billionaire named George Soros, who was pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars to support Genevieve Jones Wright. What's the latest? The latest is actually that we've seen some ads being pulled from air. George Soros, even though over $2 million he's personally put into this race, we're seeing now that he's taking some of that back and some of this airtime, he's actually canceling it. And we're not totally sure why. Maybe there's some sense that the race uh, isn't as close as we think it is. There was a recent poll that shows about a 40 point difference between the two candidates, although there are a lot of undecided voters still. So we'll see what happens come Tuesday. Now on to the county supervisors race, District 4. There, there are two candidates, both Democrats running, and they're being supported by two different labor groups. Can you tell us what's the story there? Yeah, so the story is that we've got two Democrats who are both hoping to flip this seat to a Democratic seat. It's traditionally a Republican seat, so it's a pretty high-profile race. And Nathan Fletcher is a Democrat who's being backed by the San Diego Imperial County Labor Council. And that is an organization that his wife, Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, who is an assemblywoman, used to run. Mm -hmm. So he's getting support from that organization. Meanwhile, the other Democrat, Lori Saldana, is getting support from the Working Families Council. And that's a group that broke off of the union that is supporting Fletcher. So these two candidates are really going neck, neck and neck. They're both getting a lot of support from the outside groups. And these two groups are also launching targeted campaigns against one another. Don't vote for Nathan Fletcher. Don't vote for Lori Saldana. So there's a lot of um, negative ads out there as well. So it sounds like it is heating up in this final stretch. iNews Source reporter, Jill Castellano, thank you so much. Thank you. iNews Source is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. Term limits rules will change the face of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors this year. Supervisor Ron Roberts will step down from the District 4 seat thanks to those rules. Former California Assemblywoman Lori Saldana is one of five candidates in the race to replace him. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen spoke to her about her campaign. Lori Saldana, thanks for joining us. Let's start talking about the county reserves. There's about $2 billion uh, in reserves, and some of that money is spoken for, but some of it could be spent pretty much however the County Board of Supervisors wants. So how would you spend some of that money? Investing in people's health, welfare, uh, food, addressing food insecurity, addressing housing insecurity. Uh, governments are strong when they're the people they represent are strong. And if we have sick people who can't work and generate revenues, then we won't have a strong county government. And so we definitely need to invest some of these reserves um, into making sure people are healthy and housed and well-fed and secure, deal with public safety issues that are continuing to be a problem. Pretty much every candidate in this race has called for more housing to be built to help relieve this, the, this region's housing shortage. Uh, there's pretty much universal agreement on that, but there's not always agreement on where that housing should go. So where do you think, and look at, looking at the county unincorporated areas, where do you think that housing should be built? Well, I'm a fan of infill. When I chaired the housing uh, committee in the assembly, I was all for more density, but we need to make sure that communities are prepared for that. We need to have the infrastructure ready. Uh, my district had 75% of the condo conversions, and I, I have seen when you have more people in smaller spaces and you don't provide adequate parking or transit, you wind up with a very negative impact on existing communities. So we want to make sure we have better transit to go along with density. And if we are going to expand growth into the backcountry, we need transit to allow people the choice to not drive their cars, but to come into San Diego on light rail or other systems. Uh, 
The other thing is we have to stop criminalizing poverty and homelessness because in my neighborhood of Claremont, there are two proposals the county has made. One is a private supportive housing and one is a county housing project. And the residents and neighbors are up in arms because all they know about homelessness or many of them what they see is that these are people who wind up being arrested and jailed. And they don't understand that they are often people just like them who have fallen on hard economic times and need a little extra help to get back on path with their lives. You support safe access to marijuana, I believe Absolutely. medical and recreational marijuana. Uh, the County Board of Supervisors has voted recently to ban all dispensaries. Uh, did you, looking at the ordinance that they previously had, allowing some medical dispensaries in the unincorporated areas, did you think that was the right kind of law? Was it too restrictive or was it too liberal? This county has a long history of overly restrictive cannabis regulations. They went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to not have to provide any access to legal cannabis cannabis under the Compassionate Use Act in 1996. So San Diego has sadly uh, has a very long legacy of not supporting legal cannabis use. I've been a very pro-cannabis legislator in the, in the assembly. I continue that now. I want to establish an office of cannabis education, research, and health care, and make sure that people who want to use cannabis for pain management to avoid addictive drugs and opiates have that option, that we're combining our research at UCSD on medical care, and we're looking at ways to invest in business opportunities. I have been to several meetings in the last few months where investors are coming from all over Southern California to San Diego. They know we have a great population, people who are very pro-cannabis, they want to be part of opening up the opportunities and bringing in those revenues from the, the state tax structure and uh, make sure that we have law enforcement funds that would be needed. But when you drive in underground, which is what they're doing, that increases law enforcement operations and we don't have the revenues to pay for those increased operations. So they've really gone about it backwards. You were uh, a Democrat when you were in the assembly. You later left the Democratic Party and were an independent and then you came back to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, why? I was really hoping to talk some sense into them. <laughs> they are not responding to people who are saying, we want progressive leadership. We want people who will stand up for the things we believe in as Democrats, diversity. We want to fight for more funding for health care, for education. I'm the only candidate running who has a background and a consistent history of fighting for those progressive battles when I was in the legislature and we had a Republican governor. Uh, I'm sometimes criticized because I do often say I am fighting, but I'm very proud of the fact that I take on tough issues and time and time again, the zero net energy proposal with the solar roof panels that is brought forward now, I partnered with Ted Lieu, who's now in the Congress. We introduced that similar policy almost 10 years ago. I've always been ahead of the curve, looking at energy efficiency, looking at water use, looking at public safety. I fought the Minutemen 10 years ago. Now they're back on the border again. We can never give up on those progressive ideals and those progressive visions. And we know that we're not gonna meet it in our first year, our second year, maybe not our fifth year but we have to stay true to that. And that's why I'm back to the Democratic Party to say, stay true to this vision because you're going to lose voters otherwise. And we need to inspire more Democrats to vote. We have the majority of registered voters in San Diego County. If we're not inspiring them to vote, we will never have representation government that reflects the Democratic and the diverse population of this region. Lori Saldana, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Our election coverage continues online at kpbs.org slash election. We will also have special live coverage of election results next Tuesday night at 10. Republicans try to stay relevant in the governor's race. Democrats might be shut out of a key house race. And will anyone bring a serious challenge to Duncan Hunter? It's part of our election 2018 coverage. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 830. It was a homecoming for a few Guadalupe fur seals. Here's video released today of their May 17th release into the ocean by SeaWorld San Diego's rescue team after months of care. Scientists outfitted the seals with satellite transmitters. The hope is to find out where these endangered species spend their time and find their food. Thanks to conservation efforts, researchers estimate their population is up to about 15,000. Well, sunny skies are on tap for the weekend. Dodgy Aswad has tonight's forecast. 
We are looking at less clouds and less fog here across San Diego County. That means warmer temperatures as the sun begins to come out. We're going to look at the satellite and radar and we notice there's not much on the map there. And we still could see a chance for some patchy low clouds outside of that. The regional forecast on the tranquil side tonight, cooling down to 60 here in San Diego, 69 in Borrego Springs, 57 in Oceanside, and 51 in Ramona. Once again, all looking very calm and dry. We'll continue with these calm and dry conditions into your Saturday sunshine and warm temperatures begin to uh, take over San Diego County. 105 in Borrego Springs, 74 for the high in Oceanside and 84 in Ramona. Now, if you're headed out to the baseball game on Saturday, taking place at 540 p.m., we are looking at dry conditions, temperatures in the lower 70s. Winds coming out of the southwest at 7 to 14 miles per hour. But maybe you can't go out to the game because you're going to wake up bright and early for the Rock and Roll Marathon. Starting line will be at Balboa Park Sunday at 6.15 a.m. Temperatures in the lower 60s, but we'll trend to our seasonal conditions in the 70s as we continue throughout the day. And if you can't catch that first baseball game, Sunday at 3.10 p.m., Cincinnati Reds play the San Diego Padres once again, and we'll keep tranquil conditions, sunshine, temperature of 73 with a real fill of 78 at first pitch. Here's a look at our five day outlook across the region, starting at the coast where we will feel seasonable more than anything and letting go of low clouds until we head into your Wednesday. Inland temperatures going into the mid 80s by your Sunday, remaining pretty warm here and mostly sunny through your Monday mountains in the 80s on your Sunday, then dropping down into the 70s, but keeping things dry. And we'll also be looking at very warm, I should say hot conditions out towards the desert. 109 here on Sunday, 107 on your Monday. We we'll continue to be in the triple digits here with warm and sunny conditions all the way through midweek. So be sure to stay hydrated out there. Reporting for KPBS News, I'm your AccuWeather meteorologist, Daji Aswad. Back to you, Ebony. Today's weekend preview looks ahead to summer with a roundup of activities that take place outdoors. Here with more is KPBS Arts Calendar Editor Nina Guerin. Summer doesn't officially begin until later this month, but around here we mark the start of summer with the San Diego County Fair. The fair opens this weekend and runs through the 4th of July. This year's theme is how sweet it is, which means there'll be loads of sugary treats to go with all that fried food. New items for this year include chocolate pasta bowls and cotton candy ice cream sandwiches. And expect a diverse lineup of acts on the grandstand stage, including country acts like Sugarland and Little Big Town, pop favorites Hanson and Bare Naked Ladies, and comedians Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias and Larry the Cable Guy, among many others. Another popular San Diego summer activity is watching movies outdoors. And there are so many outdoor movie screenings this year, you can find one practically any night of the week. Some family-friendly favorites include summer movies in the park, featuring free screenings at community parks and rec centers from San Ysidro to Oceanside. Liberty Station Outdoor Movies also has great offerings and is located next to the public market, so you can grab gourmet picnic items beforehand. Finally, Art Around Adams is a free celebration of art and music along Adams Avenue. Local bands and singer-songwriters will perform in venues from Kensington to Normal Heights, including the return of 1970s punk rockers The Dinettes. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. Stay up to date on the San Diego art scene with the KPBS Arts Calendar and our arts newsletter. You can sign up at kpbs.org slash newsletter. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the NewsHour, President Trump says the meeting with Kim Jong-un is back on after a top North Korean official visits the White House. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. San Francisco's Tenderloin is one of the poorest neighborhoods in one of the most expensive cities in the country. But it's also a place where many residents, including thousands of kids, don't always feel safe. As part of our California Dream series, KQED's Farida Javala Romero, Romero introduces us to volunteers who are making the streets safer for kids. Uh, Tenderloin is a beautiful, beautiful place multi-layered, multi, multi and just a lot of great people. Unfortunately, we do have some issues. 
and some of those issues include drug use, drug sales and drug use. You know, the methadone clinic closes at three o'clock, and so there are usually people hanging out, and sometimes people are actively dealing and using. If you ask the average person how they feel about walking through the Tenderloin, a, a Turk area right here, most people would say that uh, it's okay, but there would always be that but. So you can imagine what a four or five or six year old must feel. There are a lot of kids here and a lot of after school programs. We just make it known to everybody that, that kids are coming, kids are about to come. And they see us, they, we have very clear, you know, indicators of, of who we are. We have green vests, we have our signs. And for the most part, everybody says, oh, it's kid time, and they take a break. All right, let's get ready to walk, guys. The whole idea is to provide a safe environment for the kids walking through what is really a high-risk area. There'll be drug dealers when we get down there, they'll be all around the park, and then um, as soon as we set up, they leave to go, you know, go somewhere else, because they know that, that we're trying to do something good for the neighborhood. There would be all these people would always be right here. Drinking. Drinking or shooting up. We need more for our kids. It was really a, a volunteer effort with residents and various organizations kind of fulfilling this, this promise to the community members. Have a safe day. Have, yeah, exactly, have a safe day. Um, yeah, we don't want to make things personal. We don't want to get you know, up in someone's face and say, hey, I need you to move. Uh, you know, hey, we've got some kids coming. We have, we have, we have a little bit of room for the kids. Um, we always want to de-escalate a situation, so, you know. Thank you. Come on, big boys and girls, come on. Good job. I'm a part of my community. I love my community. Thank you so much. I've been on both sides of the fence. See, I, I've been sitting outside. I've been homeless. I've been on drugs. I've done it all. And now I'm on the other side of the fence where I'm clear-headed, and I want to do everything I can to help my environment and my community. I can do what I can for my neighborhood today, and that's what I do. Coming out here every day, I mean, every day I come out here, and I'm doing some positive, I'm, I'm helping other people, and that's what really makes me feel like I'm, you know, like I'm doing something right. Hey, we walking, we walking, let's go! Let's go, let's go, we walking, let's go! If we can't have a safe environment for our kids, then, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with our society. We can't at least do that. That's what they're gonna think of when they think of their walk home from school. Is, is us, is, is people, you know, asking about them, caring about them, and not feeling this fear or, you know, seeing scary things. That story is part of our statewide California Dream collaboration. For more, head to kpbs.org slash dream. More than three million people call San Diego and Imperial County home. With 9,000 square miles of space, we have lots of communities across the region. As part of our KPBS Explore project, we traveled to five communities to find out what makes these places so special. Tonight, we focus on Southeast San Diego. The people explore why others can't afford to live there. People who have historically lived here can no longer afford to uh, even pay rent, and that's one of the reasons why you see a homeless problem. When I bought our property in December of 2009, we've been looking at it quite frequently, and it's doubled in cost. Gentrification is definitely happening. It's not fair. Um, you come in a community and you remove certain stores that have been here for years and years and years, mom and pop shops, then you're changing it into places and uh, things that we don't need necessarily. In business, in the housing developments, in the schools, in 
Any entity in this community, it should be a reflection of the people who built it. The housing situation in southeastern San Diego also mirrors the employment situation, and it's based on not having a livable way. Because they're on fixed income, they cannot afford $1,400 for a one-bedroom apartment. That is incredible, it's unconscionable, and politicians don't do anything about it. I want it to change, I want it to become better, but I don't want to lose what I found to love here. And not really offering home ownership and land ownership, which is the, the way you build wealth in this country, and relying on three to four families living in a home together, each working together to try to make it. That's the American dream for many, and it's a hopeless dream. It's developing, but we are trying to make sure we fight to say, no, this is for us, and we don't want to get pushed out. Is it a good thing? Yes. Is it a bad thing? Yes. You can watch the rest of this series at kpbs.org slash where I come from. We'd like to hear what you think about our series. You can join the conversation on our KPBS Facebook page. And you can find tonight's stories on our website kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.